I saw that. JavaScript is going to destruct and spread. I think I'll leave it for now, but um, do we need the clip on the yeah. recording? Yeah. That's mainly why I'm here to get the get the great recording. Cool. Um, if you want to follow along, the slides are uh, available here. Now, um, ni hao. Uh, what, what's your Lei Shen? No? Lei Shen? Thunder God? I was trying to make up my Chinese name, which is kind of basically translating Thor into Lei Shen, if that is correct. But uh, yeah, I work as a developer advocate at Stripe. Uh, Stripe, we built uh, payments infrastructure. We have a lovely office um, not too far away, uh, Anson Road. I think we might actually be hosting next month. So uh, have a look at that, 60 Anson Road, I think Maple Tree, Anson, something like that. And I don't have any plane to catch. The only thing I have to catch is the MRT, and that runs until late, so I'm gonna take out the speed a little bit here. And uh, yeah, so yeah, location Singapore. I uh, recently moved here, I think four months ago. So this was actually my first tropical Christmas, which was Quite interesting. <laughs> I miss the Christmas markets. I think that's the only thing I missed. Mulled wine. Cool. Oh yeah. Um, I've also been helping out uh, organizing uh, some meetups. So Jamstack uh, Singapore. Uh, if you know me, you know I love Gatsby static sites. Anything that's static on the edge of the internet. And then APIs, JavaScript, lovely. Um, and yeah, GraphQL Singapore, there was the first meetup yesterday, but um, if you weren't there, uh, check it out on meetup, we're gonna, gonna have some more. And yeah, Jamstack and GraphQL are great friends as well. Cool. Now, I wouldn't actually dare to try and even predict the future of JavaScript. If you know the history of JavaScript, you know it's not a good idea. Um, I'm not going to play this video, but uh, there is this great video, I think it's by uh, Fireship, The History of JavaScript, uh, and it's, it's quite interesting. If you haven't seen it, give that a go. Cool. So, yeah, instead of predicting the future, the reason why I did this talk is basically, at the beginning of the year, I love to just kind of sit down, see, okay, what has happened uh, recently in, in the JavaScript world, and you know, what is likely to come uh, to JavaScript and sort of the adjacent ecosystems. And yeah, just kind of do a little research, see what's going on, maybe learn some new stuff. And so uh, let's start with some TC39 proposals. Uh, actually, does anyone know what ECMA stands for? No? I actually just realized <laughs> I forgot it as well. It's something European Computer Machinery Association or something. Uh, and eventually they figured out, so it was founded in Switzerland, I think, in the 60s. Um, and eventually they figured out there's more to the world than uh, Europe. And so they call this ECMA International now. And so uh, TC39 is the Technical Committee uh, 39, which is working on uh, the standardization of script, namely JavaScript. And um, if you haven't seen this, it's actually pretty cool to, to sort of click around, have a look. So there's a couple stages uh, for different proposals. Let's see if we can. So we have sort of a proposal, then becomes a draft, kind of a candidate proposal, and eventually stage four uh, it is finished. I'm not going to go through this, but what we can do is we can look at some of the finished proposals which are going to make their way into uh, JavaScript in 2020. And one, I think, of my favorites is the, what is it, something chaining, conditional chaining. 
You heard of that optional chaining? So, if you've worked with JavaScript, you've likely done something like this before, especially if you're fetching data from, uh, from a server, some you know, kind of deeply nested data where it's like, okay, I want to get my user's street, but uh, I don't actually know if there is a, even an address, right? And so, I actually have to check you know, do I, do I have an address on my user object? Uh, and if so, then I can try and access the street. Now, sometimes if you do this and address is actually undefined, you get a JavaScript error. And so maybe let's actually do this. Uh, open up Node. Let's, um, do you want to do the honest, maybe? <laughs> Oh, maybe, let's try the mug, yeah. Does that work? Hello? Okay, so we're gonna have a user object, and we're just gonna, you know, have an empty object for now. And let's uh, basically actually try to sort of access the user street address. Type error cannot read proper street of undefined. Right? You're familiar with that. But now, if we do this here, the optional chaining operator, what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> yes. Unexpected token. So the thing is, it's not there yet. And there's a great resource for that, actually, which is called node.green, um, which has a lot of green, but then if we go to, oh yeah, go to chaining, it's not so green yet. But we can see here, we can use the harmony flag. Let's try that. So let's do node. Eh. Harmony. Actually, so cool. And so we checked. I think since yes, 13.04 version, uh, we can use it. So let's do again our user. And now there's no more JavaScript error, but rather it returns undefined. Isn't that amazing? Just imagine when you when you write your React components. If you if you think kind of how often you've got of the, the checking of that in there. It's gonna make life so much sweeter now. Cool, another one that is sort of uh, similar to that is the Nullish Coaleskin, Coaleskin? Operator. Um, so if you've written JavaScript, you also have likely done this quite a bit. So if we have an undefined value. Now let's um, have a look here. Let's copy this. Okay. So let's say we have, you know, generally uh, when you do this, is basically you want to check uh, is there a value defined? And, you know, for example, if it's undefined or um, you want to assign some default value. Now, this becomes problematic when our uh, default, sort of when, when our value is zero, for example. So we want to have a number. Let's actually do, 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 do. Maybe do that here. So, so we basically want to check, okay, spawn settings, if we have an animation duration, you know, we want to set it to animation duration, otherwise we want to set it to 400. So now, what do you think is 
the value of this. Four hundred. Now the problem is zero in JavaScript is a is a falsy is it falsy? What do you say? Value. So that is actually not the outcome we uh, want to get here. Now if we do the same thing, so generally what you would do now is basically you check, um, you know, is it type of number? And is it, if it's type of number, you know, all, all that fun stuff. But now you can do this. Uh, oh yeah, has already been declared, fair enough. Now let's just copy that. Now we get the actual number value instead of the wrong value. Isn't that amazing? No more type of checking. Now the downside is if you look at this, um, where was it? If you, yeah, look at this. So it's gonna probably take a while until it lands. Specifically here, this is only in uh, stage three at the moment. But if you use something like TypeScript, for example, you can already make use of these language features because TypeScript can actually compile it to um, currently usable JavaScript. So some cool thing for TypeScript is there is a TypeScript uh, playground. So maybe let's actually Copy that example over. Well, we can just do. So we have like. Equals zero. And then you want. Um, to check is duration with your mark and otherwise 400. And now you can see what actually happens, what is being translated to. We actually check if it's void or zero. Um, but eventually, all of that won't be needed because uh, in 2020, it's going to be built into, uh, into JavaScript. Cool, so some resources there, if you look at the slides, uh, you can find the links. Now, uh, moving on, yeah, TypeScript. So Carlos has uh, preached the good word of GraphQL and TypeScript and the power of types. Um, it first appeared on the 2016 Stack Overflow survey. Uh, back then, almost half of 1%, well, <laughs> Almost half a percent of developers were using TypeScript. Now, fast forward three years, uh, and TypeScript is actually in the top 10 languages with more than 20% usage. So it looks like people love their types. I've actually recently been converted uh, for types as well. So we, we released our types within the Stripe node library, and it's a game changer. Like, you don't have to look at documentation anymore. Um, because of the, the typing, uh, you get basically self-documenting uh, self docu code completion. It's fabulous. So TypeScript, probably 2020, gonna see even more of that. Um, here we can see, I think, what's that sort of roughly tripled over the past two years, Is that correct? Yeah, definitely popular and rising. Here you can see the uh, sort of the Christmas slump. Um, you're going to see that in all the graphs. Interestingly enough, people don't seem to work that much over Christmas. <laughs> cool. Moving on, uh, some of the web platform APIs that are sort of in experimental stage at the moment. Um, you might have already seen the, the web authentication API. Uh, pretty cool, it allows, you, uh, allows the browser access to um, like physical hardware tokens for authentication. 
Uh, there's a demo here you can click into uh, by Mozilla. So basically, uh, you would register your token device, and you might have seen this before. So this is um, the native uh, browser window that pops up when you use the Web Authentication API. Then when I tap my security here, key here, it's being uh, registered. And then I can actually verify that huh, I didn't even touch it. Maybe my sweat was sort of still giving it power or something interesting. But um, yeah, there's actually, if you look at the documentation, it is still a bit like the whole encryption piece and all of that sort of goes a bit over my head. But I think the gist is the server uh, creates some random number um, that is then basically signed with the public key uh, of your hardware token. Uh, you then store that signed key on your server and then later when you want to verify it, um, you basically do that again. Does it sound about right? Maybe someone wants to give a talk about the mechanics um, of it. I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna move on to the native file system API. I think that's been, um, yeah, that's, that's gonna be pretty popular, especially when you're building like Electron apps and things like that, uh, having access to the file system. Um, there's a pretty good resource here, kind of web.dev. I don't know if you've seen that. I think it's, is it by Google? Yeah. Please. That domain is fantastic, web.dev. I have Thor web.dev, which is almost as good. But um, yeah, so there's a good resource there. But then uh, it's actually not, you can't demo it that well. Uh, where there is a nice demo is the uh, native loading attribute, which now gives us uh, native lazy loading. Um, there's, there have been a ton of lazy loading libraries uh, out there in the past, but now it's uh, natively baked into the browser. And um, Matthias, who is on the uh, TC39 team, has made this great demo with the kittens. And so if you, what the lazy loading tag does is, instead of loading all the images right away, as um, the image tag comes into browser view, uh, and I need to go to all here, you can see that as we scroll and our images come into view, we're actually then fetching the images um, from our server just in time. And I mean, if you think about some of the uh, sort of data bandwidth that we get in some countries, that is definitely, uh, definitely useful. Cool, so native image loading, another one. And yeah, here you can see, so we're just saying, ah, come on, uh, loading lazy, and you can do the same for iframes as well. Uh, same tag there, cool. Moving on to some of the frameworks. Uh, one of the newcomers has been Svelte, who here has uh, heard of Svelte? And keep your hand up if you've used Svelte. Okay, so it's definitely a newcomer. I think it's been around for a bit, uh, but so last year in, I think early last year, April-ish, um, Svelte 3.0 came out. Uh, it is quite interesting as it doesn't require any dependency. So the idea is you actually compile into yeah HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, I think the idea is sort of it, it gives you it gets rid of kind of all the clutter and just keeps keeps the good stuff. And so what you can see is the actual output of this is then going to be clutter. <laughs> uh, but also what, what's cool here you can actually switch between. Uh, DOM and server-side rendering, uh, which is pretty nice. 
And maybe let's look at some more useful example. Is this interesting? Yeah, so for example, here, like SRC is a, is a shortcut for SRC equals SRC, which is pretty, pretty cool. Uh, and then also you can do styling in there. And in the end, it's just being compiled, compiled down uh, into native code. So no modules, no shadow DOM, sort of that's what it prides it, itself with. And therefore, I guess you get pretty good speeds. Um, maybe definitely, definitely something to watch in 2020. And yeah, yeah, it's been growing. It's been growing a bit uh, kind of over the past two years. But moving on to some of the more uh, popular ones, uh, Angular, React, and Vue. Uh, I think you can see React is definitely sort of the most popular here, kind of, I think even more than double than uh, Angular and Vue combined. Although growth, that doesn't look like a lot of growth, but maybe the scale is pretty big. Anyway, what's new? Did you get that picture? Or? Thanks. Okay. That's a pretty cool tool, actually. You can, um, what's the website called? You can compare sort of the NPM package downloads trends. and get the charts. Trends, NPM trends. It's a great, great tool. Makes your slides instantly beautiful. Uh, what's new? Angular, uh, apparently Ivy. I'm not really in the Angular world. Anyone excited about Ivy? Okay, no, uh, no angle. <laughs> yes? Okay, okay. Um, so Ivy is Angular's new compiler or rendering engine, something like that. Now, did I note down why it was new compiler? No, why it is interesting, I forgot. But maybe if you read the article. But what's more exciting for me is Angular finally has uh, a static site generator. So maybe if someone wants to look into that and present at the next Jamstack meetup, uh, definitely do that. So it's called Scully. I think Scully IO. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's early days, but still, still exciting. Moving on to React. Have you been hooked? Everyone loves hooks. Who loves hooks? Okay. Uh, hooks, fantastic. I, I personally don't like classes, so anything that can be functions, yes please. Uh, I also prefer factory methods before new object uh, classes. Um, so yes, functions every day. So hooks is great because we can now uh, use state and uh, effect hooks in uh, our functional components, so we don't need uh, the class stuff anymore. Uh, and another thing that is sort of in experimental mode at the moment is the concurrent mode, which uh, basically allows concurrent updates, so updates to the state at the same time. And you can imagine it basically like uh, a Git workflow with branches. Uh, so you, you branch off the state and you, sorry, you eventually merge the state back together and so now you can actually update the state uh, concurrently. So that's pretty exciting, and um, that has passed the way to the new Suspense. Uh, suspense is quite interesting for data fetching. So if you've done data fetching in React before, you've likely had sort of some, oh, you know, loading question mark, show spinner uh, component, otherwise, you know, show my actual component. And so um, Suspense actually allows us to do this declaratively. Uh, so uh, we can say, OK, Suspense, if uh, we're loading, show our spinner, uh, otherwise the profile page. And there's also a nice demo for this. Here, let's see. So maybe if we reload that, you can see here that first we're loading the profile. Uh, and then we're loading the posts, and 
it is, is really nice and readable. So that's, that's pretty cool. Suspense. Awesome. And uh, Vue, uh, I personally don't work a lot with Vue, but so apparently what's new is the composition uh, API, which uh, exposes some of Vue's core capabilities like reactive state uh, as functions. And so the great thing about that apparently is kind of allows you to, to sort of write cleaner components, uh, especially at scale, and also it allows easier uh, typing uh, of these components and as we've learned earlier it's all about the types in 2020 so that's uh, that's pretty cool anyone who uses Vue? Vue popular? okay some have you heard of the composition API? nice is it good? okay cool maybe tell us at the end of the year if it, it was great um, not forget Node.js so I think one sort of downside of uh, JavaScript that often uh, is being sort of pointed out is the single uh, threadedness of JavaScript. So with worker threads, uh, we can actually execute JavaScript in parallel uh, by managing different, different worker threads. So that, that is quite exciting. Uh, ES modules. So since node 13, we have native module support. So uh, we can use import and export instead of uh, the require statements in Node. And uh, lastly, uh, nest.js uh, has been very popular in 2019, has been growing. It's kind of a server-side uh, Node framework. Have you heard of nest? OK. Um, so yeah, again, apparently uh, good TypeScript support. I think it's also written. Are using TypeScript uh, and then also GraphQL support, but by uh, wrapping Apollo Server. So that seems to be pretty exciting. Now, uh, moving on, native mobile. So React Native versus Native Script versus Ionic. Um, I think growth has been pretty flat here. Also, what, what has happened to native script? Anyone know? Anyone use native script? No, okay, I don't know either. But um, yeah, um, not, not much has happened. Uh, React Native, we've gotten fast refresh, uh, basically kind of allows us to get near instant feedback, they call it. Uh, and then Ionic uh, has now React support. Uh, if you used Ionic before, you might know it was all about Angular, but now Ionic React is here. Does anyone use Ionic? Okay. Um, lastly, some emerging technologies. I'm not sure I can, I bucketed SwiftUI there as emerging, but um, SwiftUI uh, sort of allows you to build declarative UIs similar to React, but with the Swift programming language. So if you, uh, it is limited to iOS though. So potentially more interesting, uh, Flutter, which uses, uh, comes out of Google and uses the Dart uh, programming language, which is syntactically sort of similar to JavaScript. And here, if you look at um, the state of the Octoverse report from GitHub, Dart has actually been the fastest growing language um, in 2019. 2018 to 2019. Somewhere there. Um, and what's interesting, so Dart has um, now in beta support for the web as a target. So potentially you can actually just write your whole you know, apps and web in Dart. So maybe, maybe that's interesting. Um, lastly, maybe more excitingly, at, at the beginning of December, um, the World Wide Web Consortium ha has officially taken WebAssembly uh, into, uh, well, I guess the fourth, it's the fourth official language for the web. Um, I've linked some, some resources there that I found interesting. 
I think what sort of tripped me up a little was kind of WebAssembly as the fourth language. And I was like, don't you write? Basically, with WebAssembly, you write in like C, C++, Rust, uh, whatever. But the idea is that you write in these languages, you compile it to WebAssembly, and then WebAssembly actually allows you, uh, using JavaScript, you can then access your code that you've written in C, C++ on the web platform. So I guess it is a language that C and the other languages compile to. Um, yeah, interesting. I haven't looked into it myself, but I'd love to learn more. So if anyone wants to give a talk at the next uh, talk.js meetup, talk about WebAssembly, would be awesome. That's it uh, from me, but I'd love to hear, if we have time, uh, what are you most excited about in 2020 for JavaScript? <laughs> so uh, JSConf is happening again this year, sometime this year, next year? This year. This year. Sometime this year. Anyone else? Something, anyone? Excited? No one excited? You just shouted at us. Huh? Do I hear web assembly? Yeah, that's exciting. <laughs> Another talk, the advice last year was not to use it. Oh, okay. So maybe I can look that up on engineer studies sheet. What was the title? Don't use web assembly? No. Okay, cool. Anyway, uh, thanks everyone. Hopefully you're somewhat excited about 2020.